Welcome to the third series of online lectures. This one is on monitors and condition variables. In the first part, we'll be talking about the basics of what a monitor is and what a condition variable is, and you will learn how to use condition variables in C. So let's start off by understanding the motivation for having a new synchronization construct beyond semaphores. Well, one thing you may have learned, um, both from watching the videos and from practicing in class, is that semaphores can be hard to use. Particularly if you have complex resource patterns, it's very difficult to capture the relationship with only semaphores. For example, in the Sleeping Barber case, you couldn't use the semaphore to keep track of how many available chairs there were. What this means is that you often need extra state variables to record additional information besides just the simple counter of the semaphore, and this means you need to use extra semaphores. We found that we often needed one for mutual exclusion for the state variables, and then another semaphore for each class of thread that needs to do some weighting. The result is that semaphores can be difficult to use correctly, and as a result, they can lead to buggy code, and they can lead to it being harder than necessary to write code. To solve this problem, a long time ago, people invented a new programming construct called a monitor. Originally, a monitor was designed to be built into a programming language and not just some functions you call through a library. The idea with a monitor is that it supports controlled access to shared data. Controlled access means that the monitor keeps track of who is allowed to access the shared data and when, and the shared data means this is all about shared data accessed by multiple threads. To implement monitors, a programmer would use a monitor and the compiler would then add synchronization code automatically, for example, acquiring and releasing locks, and at runtime, those locks would then enforce the synchronization rules. So a question is, why does this help? And the reason is that it takes the effort of synchronizing your code away from the programmer and gives it to the compiler and the runtime. This means that it's less work for you, and it's also more likely to be correct because there's fewer opportunities to make bugs. Fundamentally, a monitor is kind of a software module, like a class in Java, that encapsulates first some shared data structures. So when you have shared data, you would put it together inside a monitor. Second, a set of procedures that operate on that shared data, similar to method functions in Java. And finally, synchronization rules between concurrent threads or processes that invoke those procedures. So this is how you can control when a thread should execute, when it should not execute. The major benefit of a monitor is it protects the data from unstructured access, meaning you cannot access the data without following the synchronization rules. This is like a very similar to a private member variable inside an object-oriented language. This means if you can only access it through the right procedures, then you can only access it in the right way, and you won't have as many synchronization problems. Here's a picture of what a monitor looks like. The monitor itself is the blue box, and inside there are operations shown as rectangles, and there's some shared data, which is the data operated on by those procedures. I need to note here that monitors were invented in a time before there were threads, and people looked at them in the kernel of different processes. So much of the terminology for monitors uses processes and threads interchangeably. So at most, one of the rules of the monitor is that a monitor provides mutual exclusion between all the procedures for the shared data. This means that only one thread or process can be executing it at a time. If other threads or processes want to access it, they have to enter a queue and wait to enter the monitor. The major facility of a monitor is mutual exclusion, as you just saw, meaning that only one thread can be executing at a time. Thus, synchronization is implicitly associated with a monitor. This means every time a thread enters a monitor procedure, the monitor runtime will acquire a lock that prevents other monitor procedures and that same one from being called. Thus, if a second thread tries to enter a monitor procedure or a different one, that thread blocks until the first has left the monitor. Note that this is more restrictive than semaphores, because semaphores made no restriction on when threads could execute. But it's easier to use most of the time, because most of the time this is what we want. We want mutual exclusion over some data. Notice also that here we are explicitly associating synchronization with data. Previously, the programmer had to remember which semaphore to use with which data. Here, the monitor has both the data and the mutual exclusion rules built into it. One thing that happens, though, is once a thread is inside a monitor, it may discover it can't continue or it might wish to sleep. Suppose the thread is waiting for something to happen. Consider, for example, a bank account where a thread is waiting for the balance to be above a certain value before it continues. In that case, the thread may wish to wait until some thread comes in and makes a condition true. Another example would be a bounded buffer, where a consumer thread may need to wait until a producer thread produces some data. Monitors use something called a condition variable as part of the monitor that allows a thread to wait and to be signals. Condition variables have two operations, wait, which waits for a condition variable to be signaled, and signal, which signals a condition variable and can wake up other threads. 
One thing to note is that condition variables should only be accessed from inside the monitor. Um, in a language where the monitors are built in, this can be enforced. Another thing about using monitors is something called a monitor invariant. This is basically the consistency rules for the data. So typically any data structure has some rules on what it means to be a correct data structure. In the bounded buffer example, it means that the count of items should be between zero and the size of the buffer. If the count of items is less than zero or greater than the size of the buffer, something is wrong. In a doubly linked list, you might want to say that the list is completely connected in both forwards and backwards directions. In a priority queue, you might want to say that for all the items in the list, the priority of an item must be less than the priority of it or equal to the priority of its successor. The rule with monitors is that this inherent variant must hold whenever the monitor lock is free, whenever no thread is inside the monitor. While it's held, you can violate these invariants to manipulate the data structures, for example, while inserting into a linked list or priority queue. By the time the thread releases the lock, though, it must make sure the invariant holds. This means that any thread entering the monitor can always assume at the top of a procedure that the invariant holds, such as the linked list is correctly formed. Now, as I said, monitors were originally constructed to be part of a language. Originally, it was called Concurrent Pascal and were adopted as part of Java. If you want to use a monitor in Java, you use the synchronized keyword on a method. So here's a counter where you have a private integer. If you want to have a procedure that guarantees mutual exclusion, you can put the keyword synchronized in front of the procedure, here increment. This means that the compiler will automatically acquire a lock on the object being used on entry to the function increment and release the lock automatically when it leaves. This is nice because you don't have to write the code. You don't have to remember that this is shared state and you have to acquire a lock and you don't have to remember to release it. In C, things aren't so good. You have to add the locks yourself because monitors are not part of the C language. Instead, monitors are typically implemented as a library. They're provided by the pthread library. In this case, there are functions in library to use the basic mutual exclusion of monitors. You can just use pthread mutic locks. Here's the same example how you would code it in C. You would have a data structure and you would put a lock inside the data structure explicitly. And then in your procedures that manipulate the data structure, you would add code to acquire the lock at the beginning and release the lock at the end. So the effect is the same as in Java. The difference is you have to write the code yourself and let, instead of letting the compiler do it for you. Condition variables are what make monitors interesting. I said before that there were signal and wait operations on monitors. The thing that you signal or wait on is called a condition variable. In this way, it's very similar to a semaphore, which also has a signal and wait operation. What's important to note is that the way condition variable signal and wait works is very different than the way semaphores work. The major difference is that condition variables don't have any history. Remember, with semaphores, when you signal a monitor, the value gets incremented, meaning that a subsequent call to wait may not wait because the semaphore remembers the value of the counter. In a condition variable, there is no history associated with the condition variable. If somebody calls signal, one thread calls signal, another thread calls wait later, that later thread has no way of knowing that signal was called previously. We'll see how this works in practice in a little while. There are three operations that can be used on condition variables. The first operation is wait. So when you wait in a condition variable, the wait operation will release the monitor lock so somebody else can get in. This is important because remember the reason to wait is you're waiting for something to become true. And if you're holding the lock, nobody can change the state variables that you're waiting for to change. So when you call wait, the wait operation will release the lock and it will add the thread to a queue saying that it's waiting for a signal. This means that condition variables implicitly are really just queues. They don't actually have any state of their own. The second operation is called signal or sometimes notify. This means that when a thread calls signal, it will wake up one thread that is waiting on the condition variable, if any. If no threads are waiting, signal does nothing at all. While calling signal, the signaling thread keeps the monitor lock and keeps running on the CPU. It does not immediately switch to the waiting thread. Instead, the waiting thread is made ready to run, meaning that it is taken off the queue, but the waiter now has to wait to get the monitor lock. So the waiter will run when the signaler leaves the monitor. This means that when the signaler actually starts running, the condition it was waiting for may not become true. And again, we'll see what this means in a little bit. One thing to note here also is that Wait releases the monitor lock, meaning that the monitor invariant must be true before calling wait. Signal does not release the monitor lock, so the, the, the monitor invariant does not need to be true when calling signal. The final operation is broadcast, also called notify all. This will wake up all the threads that are waiting on a condition variable. 
This can be nice if you want to, for example, tell all the threads in the system that you're done with something they're waiting, or if you have threads waiting on different things, you can wake them all at once and let them figure out whether they're done or not. Again, we'll see how this works in a little while. Let's talk more about how to, how to correctly wait on things. When a thread waits on a condition variable, it releases the monitor lock and puts the wait, waiting thread on the condition variable's queue. The one important thing that it guarantees is that no other thread enters the monitor before the thread is on the queue. This means that nobody will call signal between the time when it decides to wait and actually gets put on the queue. Threads will then stay on the queue until they're signaled if they're at the head of the queue or there's a broadcast which wakes up all the threads in the queue. After a thread has been signaled, the, any thread that was woken up has to now wait to get the monitor locked before returning. So it doesn't immediately get to go inside the monitor and start running again. Instead, it has to wait for the lock. An important thing to notice is there might be other threads already waiting on the lock that this thread queues behind. So here's a general use of how to use wait and signal. This is a counter example. So we have a counter structure. It has a lock, which is the monitor lock, and a condition variable, p thread condi above zero. This condition variable represents the condition of is the counter above zero. We have three operations on the counter. The first is increment. The increment code will acquire the lock. It will then increment the counter. If the counter value is above zero, it will call p thread con signal on the above zero condition variable and then release the lock. The idea here is if any thread is waiting for the value to be above zero, it will get signaled when this happens. The decrement counter um, will again acquire the lock, uh, decrement the counter, and release the lock. In this case, it does not signal the value because the value will never go from not being above zero to being above zero when decrementing. The final function is a print val function that waits for the counter value to be above zero and then prints out the value. Notice in the middle of this function that if the value is less than or equal to zero, the print val function will call pthread cond wait for it to become above zero. The idea here is that with condition variables, you test the condition using an if statement Basically, on some predicate, you want to become true over your shared state. If it's not true, you call pthread cond wait, and then when it returns, hopefully that condition is true. Another thing to note is that with the library version of condition variables, you need to pass in the lock to the condition variable wait function also, and the reason is that when you wait on a condition variable, you have to release the lock. However, this is actually an incorrect use of signal, and the reason is, as I said, that the condition you're waiting for, in this case, that the count is not less than or equal to zero may not be true anymore. Consider, for example, the schedule of threads shown in the lower right. The counter starts up at minus one. The first thread, 3t1, will run and call increment and raise the count to zero. Suppose thread two comes along and calls print val. In this case, the count is zero, so it waits. Thread three may come along and call increment, um, which will raise the count to one, and it will call signal. However, thread one may come along and try to get into the monitor before thread two finishes waking up and gets into the monitor. In this case, thread one may come along and decrement the counter back to zero. So when thread two wakes up, the count will be zero and it'll print out the wrong value. The problem here is that the print val function did not check whether the condition C arrow count is less than or equal to zero was true or false after it woke up from the wait. This is a general problem or issue with using condition variables and signals which is that whatever condition you're waiting for to become true may not actually become true. This means that a signal is really, in some ways, a hint that something may have happened, not a guarantee that it did happen. The major reason is that another thread may have entered the monitor between the call to signal and when the thread actually wakes up. The implication of this is that when using a condition variable to wait for something, you have to check your conditional predicate inside a loop, typically a while loop. The box on the right shows the correct code for using condition variables to wait on a counter. Instead of using if C arrow count is less than or equal to zero, it says while C arrow count is less than or equal to zero, p thread cond wait. This means that if the thread wakes up, it will retest is the counter above zero. If it is not above zero, it'll go back to sleep. If it is above zero, it keeps going. Now most of the time, the condition you're waiting for will have happened and you don't need the while statement. However, it may not happen, and in those cases, to make your code be correct in all cases, you need to use the while statement. This is the end of the first part of the lecture on condition variables monitors. Please take the first quiz on condition variables before watching the next lecture.